Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. You are all fortunate today, and I am indeed glad for you. For today's story was written by the genius who gave us Tiny Tim, Scrooge, David Copperfield, Oliver Twist, literally a world of unforgettable characters. Very rarely did Charles Dickens spin out for us a mystery. But today, we will untangle the web of just such a story. Mr. Sampson, I came here this evening to tell you of the peculiar circumstances of the girl's death. She was very young. Too young to die. I don't know how or where to begin. It's difficult because you loved the girl. I know. No, you don't know. I loved her as I have never loved anyone. But if the whole truth were known, I led her to her death. I murdered her. Our mystery drama, Hunted Down, written by Charles Dickens, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Gordon Heath. spent quite a bit of time in the United States. He toured the country reading his stories. He even wrote some here. This story, Hunted Down, appeared serially in the New York Ledger in August 1850. But this account of deception and murder could have happened today, over 125 years later. The same idea has been copied by modern authors, but no one has ever told it as vividly as Charles Dickens. This is the way it begins. My name is Edgar Sampson. I am the chief manager of London Life, one of England's oldest life insurance companies. To deal in insurance, one must know how to judge a man. If you can't do that, chances are you would be deceived, and your company could lose a fortune to the unscrupulous. Which brings me to the first time I met up with Julius Slington. Adams, who is that man dressed in black who just left the office? Uh, just now, uh, th th that was Mr. Julius Slington. One of our clients. No, 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 he's not insured with us, not as far as I know. He has an air about him, I say, like a warning. A warning. As if he was saying, not in so many words, take me just as I show myself. Come along. Follow the gravel path. Keep off the grass. I permit no trespassing. Oh, I see what you mean, Mr. Sampson. Mr. Slinton is all business. Nothing wrong with that, but this gentleman wants to be sure you know it. Well, if that's it, he put on a very big act for the little he wanted. Which was... A few application forms for a friend of his who wants to take out life insurance. Why did he come to London Life, did he say? Yes, he did. Said he was recommended by a friend of yours. Of mine, Adams? Did he know my name? Uh, yes, sir. He looked over here and said, Ah, there's Mr. Sampson. N not that I've had the pleasure, so I shan't trouble him. Huh. Well, that'll be all, Adams. You may go back to your desk. <laughs> No, I didn't like the looks of this Slington. He had smiled too much at Adams, was too agreeable. A week later, I went to see an old friend for dinner. And who should be there but Julius Slington? Edgar Sampson. Well, the work seems to agree with you. Oh, I must admit, Tom, I enjoy it. It was nice of you to ask me over for a meal. Do you know that fellow over there, standing by the mantelpiece? Well, of course I know him. I'm not in the habit of inviting strangers to eat with me. Then, since we are both under the same roof, introduce me. Certainly. Uh, Julius, I want you to meet Edgar Sampson. Julius Slington. How do you do? How do you do? Well, you know, I thought you two had met. Uh, Julius was thinking about some life insurance. <laughs> I told him to look you up. I did look in at Mr. Sampson's office on your recommendation, Tom. But since all I wanted was a few insurance forms, I didn't want to trouble him. I would have been glad to help you. I'm sure of that, and I'm very much obliged. Another time, perhaps? You're thinking of insuring your life? No, dear, no. I'm afraid I'm not so prudent as all that. I was inquiring for a friend. 
I hear that London life has recently suffered a great loss. In money? No, no, in talent and vigor. I was not aware of it. I speak of your Mr. Meltham. Oh, to be sure. He is a great loss. A young man so energetic. Yes, it is a shame. You uh, knew Meltham? Only by reputation. Very young, wasn't he? About 30. To suddenly become incapable of business at that young age. Any reason for his sudden, uh, what should I call it? Oh, my dear Slington, I, I, I see Tom is telling us dinner is served. Oh, will you excuse me? What can I tell you? I simply could not bear the fellow. I thought him prying, insincere. And I'm sure he must have realized I was having second thoughts about him. But my reactions didn't stop Slington. He even sat himself next to me, and after dinner, as we were lighting up cigars, there he was again, at my elbow. I didn't want to go into this at the table. But as we were saying before, this young chap, Meltham, who used to work for you, whatever happened, do you suppose, that he should suffer, uh, suffer... Suffer what, Mr. Slinkton? I was going to say, a nervous breakdown. Is that what you've heard? In a way. I understand he was actually, how can I put it, broken-hearted. Something about a girl. Although it didn't seem probable to me, Meltham being a young man so distinguished and attractive. Attractions and distinctions are no armor against death. Ah, uh, the lady died. Pardon me, I did not know that. That does make it very sad. Poor Mr. Meltham. She died. Ah, dear me. Lamentable. Lamentable. Do you think this Slington is genuine? Neither did I. Why this commiseration for Melson, whom he couldn't have known very well, if at all? What was Slington up to? Mr. Sampson, you're surprised to see me so moved about a man I have never known. But I am not so disinterested as you suppose. I have suffered, and recently too, from death myself. I have lost one of two charming nieces who were my constant companions. She died barely 23, and her remaining sister is far from strong. Ah, uh, my dear Mr. Sampson, the world is a grave. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, I'll have a word with the ambassador. Well, dear Edgar, you seem to have spent a good part of the evening talking to Slington. He's not a bad chap, really. For some reason, Tom, heaven knows why, he's followed me from my first glass of wine to my last cigar. How long have you known him, Tom? Oh, a few months. I met him at Busoni's, uh, the painter. He used Slington in Italy, where he'd been on holiday with his two nieces. One of them died, and he returned to London. He, uh, wasn't annoying you, was he? Not really. There are some people who travel from house to house, visiting acquaintance to acquaintance, and in that way acquire ready-made friends. Oh, come now, Edgar. Julius Lincoln is not that much of an opportunist. My dear Tom, when your very livelihood and the success of your company depends upon knowing whom you are dealing with, it... You saying, Edgar... That some inner voice in you is warning you all may not be what it seems with dear Julius? Precisely. With regard to that gentleman, I should be extremely surprised if all were what it seems. Good morning, Mr. Sampson. That gentleman is here again. He's been waiting to see you. Slinkton? Yes. Ah, Mr. Sampson, good day to you. It's the matter of the insurance policy. Oh, yes, the forms you brought to your friend. Yes. The fact is, I'm no little taken by surprise by what my friend has done by way of life insurance. Has he filled out the application? He told me so. What is his name, Mr. Stinkton? Beckwith. Adams, if you have a life application there from a Mr. Beckwith, would you bring it in? You see, Beckwith and I live in the same digs in Middle Temple top of the same staircase. His door is opposite mine. 
Here it is, Mr. Sampson, that Mr. Alfred Beckwith applies for £2,000 life insurance. Thank you, Adams. Mm. Mm, yes, seems to be an order. Oh. He names you as beneficiary, Mr. Slinkton. I never thought he would. I suppose he has no other relatives. No, it's done all the time. The naming of friends as beneficiaries. Now, you, for your part, must also fill out one of our forms. That night, I was at home when I had a visit from a young man I had not seen in several months. John Milton. Yes. It's been a long time, Mr. Sampson. Too long, dear John. My boy, you look terrible. What have you been doing with yourself? Well, I'm, I'm not up to sorts. John, I don't think you should have quit the company. When a sad event happens through an accident of fate... Uh, may I interrupt you, Mr. Sampson? This was no mere sad event, but a tragedy. A great tragedy. Nor, believe me, was it a simple accident of fate. My point is, no matter how tragic, one's days must go on. To do that, the best medicine is to fill your hours with work. Come back to London life, John. We'll welcome you like a shot. I can't do the work. I've lost faith in my ability to judge or understand motives. I would be worthless to you. All because a girl we insured dies. No, let, let, let's not talk about it. At any rate, I've decided on another line of work. Something I'd rather do. I hope it pays you well. And I hope you are as good at it as you were in insurance. All of us thought you were a marvelous agent. And your commissions proved it, didn't they? Mr. Sampson, all they proved is I put money ahead of humanity. And that's what... That's why I... I can't say it. It's why Marguerite is dead. I'm sorry the pain is still with you. I loved her, Mr. Sampson. Oh, how I loved her. Death is a part of life, you know. Yes, yes I can accept that. But not the reason for her death. I came this evening to tell you of the peculiar circumstances surrounding her death. She was very young. Too young to please, die. Please, please, please. Say nothing. As you wish. I shall sit here and listen. This is very difficult for me to talk about. I'm sure it is. I know. No, you don't. I killed Marguerite. I did. Yet I love that girl as I have never loved anyone before or ever shall again. But if the whole truth were known, I and I alone led her to her death. I murdered her. What have we here? Quite a turn of events, huh? Our man, Edgar Sampson, who manages London life, meets, dislikes, and suspects the sincerity of one Julius Slinkton. Then his former employee, John Meltham, confesses to a murder. Is there a link between these three men? If there are answers, let us hope they are forthcoming when I return shortly with Act Two. Charles Dickens came to his interest in mystery, murder, and the work of detection late in his creative life. Not that social injustice, which he constantly assailed, was foreign to him, but specific chicanery like that in this story was a new subject for Dickens. Certainly none of his characters before John Meltham had ever confessed to murder. I killed that sweet girl just as certainly as if I had put a bullet through her head. John... John, I want you to calm down. It's been too much for me to bear alone. Uh, let me, in my own way, tell you how it happened. I was sitting at my desk at London Life. Uh, you you were away, I believe. Mr. Milton, there is a young lady come to inquire about insurance. Do you think you can see her? Yes, why, certainly, Adams. What is her name? Oh, I don't need to be announced. I'm not royalty. Marguerite Niner. And you, sir? Uh, John Milton. Uh, pray, sit down. Mr. Melton, London Life has been recommended to me as trustworthy. I wish to deal with a company that will make good on its promises to pay. I sincerely hope, Miss Niner, that day is in the very distant future. We all hope that, Mr. Melton. But death does not always consult our wishes. Yes, sir, how old are you? 
23. You are smiling, Mr. Merton. <laughs> yes, of course we will insure you. But may I say, for one so young and beautiful, it seems to me that you're... I appreciate the compliment. May I have the forms to... <gasps> uh... <sighs> oh, please. May I, may I... Could I have a glass of water? I, I don't feel at all well. Uh, Miss, Miss Niner. Uh, Miss... Miss Niner. Oh, good Lord. She's fainted. Adams, come here, quickly. In a matter of moments, she had come to of her own accord. Adams and I lifted this beautiful creature and carried her to the couch in your office, Mr. Sampson. I had heard she'd some slight indisposition, but I had no idea the poor girl had fainted. Well, she insisted we immediately begin to process her policy. When I asked her if she was under doctor's care, she actually implied they had all given her up. Well, right there, I should have said, my dear young lady, if indeed you have a history of illness, London life cannot insure you. But she was so intense about taking it out as she lay there, looking at me deeply with her lavender eyes, reaching and touching my heart. I, well, how could I refuse her? I, I could not. I understand. Extenuating circumstances. <sighs> I loved her. There could be no other reason. I'm 30 years old. And for the first time in my life, I knew love. John, perhaps insuring Miss Niner without medical approval was foolhardy, but I would hardly call that an act of murder. Why, she was abroad in Italy when it happened. As I know now, Marguerite did not die a natural death. You have proof? Not yet. But one must have proof. Let us say I have enough. But whether at this moment I have adequate proof or not... I shall follow the person I believe directly responsible until the ends of the earth. Surely the police... Oh, no. Now, they may have this person later. For now, it is my satisfaction to avenge the deed. John, I believe the death of this young lady is something you should completely erase from your mind. It is unhealthy to dwell upon it, and it could wreck your life. And supposing you were wrong, that hers was a natural death... I cannot forget the day she passed away. It was only one month of the day her life policy went into effect. It was also the day I had purchased a wedding ring. It was quite late when John Meltham left my house. We kept in touch, and in September, I went down to Eastbourne for a breath of sea air. Who should be walking the beach that very late afternoon but Julius Slington with a beautiful girl on his arm. A very delicate, very pale and melancholy young lady dressed in mourning. Mr. Sampson, as I live and breathe. Hi, Mr. Slington. This is a coincidence. How, sir? I was thinking of you just the other day. In a kindly fashion, I hope. Ah, uh, Mr. Sampson, this is Miss Niner, my niece. Marjorie, this is Mr. Sampson. Delighted, I'm sure. How do you do? Are you strolling, Mr. Sampson? Shall we stroll together? With pleasure. Marjorie and I are about to take this rather steep climb to the top of Beachy Head. Ah, look there. The mark of wheels and sand. The wheels of a hand carriage. Marjorie, my love, your shadow, no doubt. Miss Niner's shadow. <laughs> oh, not a sun shadow. Uh, Marjorie, my dear, tell Mr. Sampson. There is nothing to tell except that I constantly see the same invalid old gentleman at all times, wherever I go. When I'm strolling the beach or, uh, as we are now, mounting the path to the cliffs. Oh, there he is within sight, being wheeled about in a bath chair. Strange. Does he live in Eastbourne? He is staying here. Do you live in Eastbourne? Uh, no. Also merely staying. <laughs> Dear Uncle Julius is concerned over my health, so he has me staying with the family. And your shadow? My shadow, I fear, is like myself. Not very robust. <laughs> He's always bundled up. You can hardly see his face. I don't think I should know him if I were to meet him. I think I see his bath chair down there coming towards us. I've not seen him for days. But it does happen. Wherever I go, this gentleman goes. Oh, <laughs> I'm 
quite out of breath from the climb. Uncle, can we rest a bit? Certainly, my dear. We're practically at the top. Isn't that your shadow now, at the foot of our path? Yes. Ah, oh, there he is. And notice, he's always having his bath chair pushed by the same grey-haired gentleman. Will you both excuse me for a moment? I think I know the gentleman. Good evening, Mr. Sampson. I'm glad you arrived before it got dark. Sure, I must congratulate you upon your disguise. You make an admirable elderly bundled-up gent. Thank you. Uh, your manservant does well as a porter. I knew he would. I came as soon as I got your message. Sir, Marjorie Niner is in danger of her life. I quite understand. We must get her away from him. I shall do my best. No. Not like dear Marguerite, her sister. We must save her. I have every intention. Keep us inside, John. And I shall do my best to effect a rescue. He must not know that we know. Have no fear. Oh, bless you, sir. Good Lord. They're gone. I can't see them up there. I must start back. Hurry! Hurry! I ran up the steep path at Beachy Head, filled with frightening thoughts of what the area is known for. As I got to the top, I saw Marjorie Niner at the very edge, struggling with Slinton. Uh, stop! Stop! Uh, uh, oh, how? Oh, oh, it's you, Samson. Oh, thank uh, heaven. I thought we'd lost her. Miss Niner, uh, what is it? Uh, I don't... No, right. I, 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 I was just looking down there at those oh, sharp, jagged rocks, and I must have lost my balance or something. It, it felt like I was being pushed. Or, oh, no, and then I heard you cry stop, and then Uncle Julius reached out, and, and he caught me. He caught me before I fell. Oh, my dear Marjorie, I think this climb was too much for you. But it was your idea, Uncle. Are you all right, Miss Niner? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Sampson. Well, Mr. Sampson, who was he? I beg your pardon? Marjorie is dying to know who her shadow is. Oh, yes, the old gentleman. He is an intimate friend of our mutual friend, Tom, at whose house we first met. A certain Major Banks, an old East India director. You have heard of him? Banks? Never. Very rich, Miss Niner, but very old and very crippled. He has been much interested in you, even at the long range. He was telling me of the affection he observed between you and your uncle. Our affection is always a strong one, for we had but few near ties. There are but two of us. Samson, would you be a good fellow, Sit here with my niece while I run back and fetch her medicine. I shall be glad to. Oh, Uncle, I'm putting you to such trouble. It's hateful tasting stuff. I shall be as quick as I can. Please be careful. It's almost dark now and the path is steep. Don't worry, my dear. Half an hour or so and I shall be back. He is such a good man. Miss Snyder, tell me more about your uncle. Oh, you have no idea. He cared for my sister, his untiring devotion to her strange illness. Strange? Well, she just wasted away. No one could ever explain it satisfactorily. Your sister passed away in Italy? Yes. How did you know? We were taking a journey, mostly for her health, and in this little town high in the Dolomites, where there was no doctor, no help whatsoever, she passed away. They had her buried there. You have no family? No one to wish her remains back in England? Marguerite and I are orphans. We have no money, no one, nothing. Oh, I signed a little insurance over to Uncle Julius, as did Marguerite. Otherwise, we were quite alone in the world until he came into our lives. He made us call him Uncle, but we're, we're not related, really. May I call you Marjorie? Certainly. I ask that because someone very dear to your sister is very dear to me. And he is much concerned over your well-being. He has a right to be so. I have a feeling that my life is drawn to an end, even as did Marguerite's. It must be in our blood. Marjorie, do you have any idea why Mr. Slington brought you to Eastbourne? Ah, uh, yes. For the restorative powers of the sea air. This very place where we now sit, this cliff, is called Beachy Head. Do you know what it is famous for? In all of England, 
what Beachy Head is known for. No. Suicides. What? You heard me right. Suicides. When I came up the cliff path just now and saw you in your uncle's arms, suicide is what flashed to my mind. If you had dropped over the edge, would it have looked like suicide? But, but I, I, I thought I, I tripped. Oh. And you thought he caught you, perhaps. What are you saying, Mr. Sampson? And the medicine you find distasteful, does it not make you feel worse rather than better? Uh, uh, Uncle Julius said one must expect that. Why must one? Marjorie, time presses. Heed my warning. Collect your strength, your resolve. Had you been alone up here, one misstep, and this moment you would be lying shattered on those rocks below. Believe me, the next time your life will not be spared. I cannot believe you. You must. As your friend, as your sister's friend, I entreat you, Marjorie, without one moment's loss of time, come with me, and I shall bring you to the man you call your shadow. He can tell you better than I of the danger to your life. I had barely the time to run with her to the bath chair where Melton was waiting. As the evening star rose into the heavens over Beachy Head, I saw them disappear and the tall, familiar form of Julius Slington make his way up the cliff to my side. The tall man with his hair parted in the middle had an air about him that said to Edgar Sampson, keep off the grass. Now, as he approaches Sampson, the sign seems to read, look out. Danger. We have a devious and cunning man, possibly a murderer, pitted against a clever and just man. What happens will be revealed when I return in a few moments with Act Three. Night has fallen on the English seacoast town of Eastbourne. The waves are high and signal an impending storm. But in the air is not only a storm at sea, but a storm of anger, which might break at any moment. The young lady, fortunately, has been spirited away to safety. Edgar Sampson sits on a rock high on the beachhead cliffs and waits. Ah, Mr. Sampson, my niece is not here. Miss Niner felt the growing chill and has gone home. Indeed. I persuaded her. Ah, She's easily persuaded for her own good. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. She's better within doors. Safer? I thought so, too. I shall have to take her medicine down to her, then. She is very delicate. Very. Since the unfortunate death of her sister, Marjorie has not fared well. But we must hope. Do you stay here in Eastman long, Mr. Sampson? I know. I'm going away tonight. Oh, so soon. Has the sea air restored you so quickly? Events, Mr. Slington. Events have quite restored me, thank you. I'm going back. To London? To London. And I'd better start down. That storm is overtaking us. Ah, uh, Mr. Sampson, may I ask? A poor Tom Meltham, who we spoke of. He has been stricken, you are telling me? He indeed, yes. Fatally. Ah. Uh, is he dead yet? Not when I last heard of him, but too broken a man to live long. And hopelessly lost to us at London Life. Were he even to live, which I doubt, he will never be the man he was. Oh, dear, dear. Sad. The world is a grave... A few days later, I arranged to see Marjorie Niner in London. I selected the safest place possible. An address where I was certain we could meet in broad daylight had not been observed. In front of the statue of Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens. Mr. Sampson, my head is still in a whirl. I, I honestly don't know what to make of all this. That is exactly the reason, Marjorie. Honesty. 
You mean... I mean that most of us take at face value the actions of others. We begin by trusting them. We expect them, in return, to treat us honestly. The man you call your uncle exploited you, and your sister, shamefully, criminally. And it is only a matter of time before he is caught in his own web. Uncle Julius. It's so hard for me to believe. He seemed so devoted to us. We often remarked at our extraordinary good fortune to have been befriended two girls working in a factory we were by this charming, lovely, thoughtful person who never made an untoward move in any way. His only interest, Marjorie, is money. It seems a shame to be talking about such a man in this beautiful place. Hmm. Do you know... I haven't been to Kensington Gardens since I was a little girl. And did you know another little girl was born right over there in Kensington Palace? And she always played in these gardens. Queen Victoria. <laughs> Margaret and I would roll our hoops right along this path. I miss her so, Mr. Sampson. I wish we had never met Mr. Slinkton. I wish it with all my heart. Just try to believe... All that has happened is perhaps a dream. You'll wake up, Marjorie, and the world will be beautiful again. I just thought that nice man, Mr... Uh, or the one who helped me get away from Beachy Head, my shadow. Peter Pan could never get his shadow to stick on. That's better. You're smiling. Good things can happen tomorrow. Remember that. Even little Peter Pan believed that. I must be going now. I shall watch over you even more closely than your shadow at Beachy Head. How long must I remain with Mr. Meltham's sister? Until we are certain Mr. Slinkton no longer roams the streets. When will that be? Soon, I hope. Very soon. The final thread of the web led me to the building where Julius Slinkton lived. The top floor. He on one side of the stairs, and on the other, the gentleman whose life he had insured with us, Mr. Beckwith. Hey, hey, who is that? Oh, is it welcome? Enter, my good man. Excuse me, I noticed the name on the door. Alfred Beckwith. That is me. Do you know me? By name only. I'm with London Life. Ah, yes, you are looking for my dear friend, Slinkton, no doubt. He is uh, across the hall. I call him. Julius? Julius Caesar! You have a visitor! Uh, oh, uh, what did you uh, say your name was? Sampson. I, I, Julius Caesar! The sun is over the yard arm! Alfred, what is the matter with you? Oh, oh, Mr. Sampson, what brings you here? Mr. Beckwith, will you excuse us a moment? Uh, where can we talk, Mr. Slinkton? Right outside, on the landing. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, you, you are excused, uh, but I shall expect you back. Is this your friend, Beckwith, who you insured with us? I'm afraid it is. I'm exceedingly sorry to say. But surely you could be of some help. He is your friend, you said. His rooms are in such disorder. How can anyone live like that? By the way he looks, I'd say he's in the last stages of delirium tremens. I'm as saddened as you. Yes, he's a very great friend. He must have been very ill, even before I knew him. Now I can do nothing with him. Nothing at all. <clears throat> How is your niece, Mr. Slinkton? My niece? Marjorie Niner. The one I met with you at Beachy Head. I'm sorry to say, Mr. Sampson, that my niece has proved treacherous and ungrateful. She left me without a word of notice or explanation, simply disappeared. No doubt she was misled by some designing rascal. You may have heard of it. I did hear she was misled by some designing rascal. In fact, I have proof of it. Are you sure of that? Quite. Are you both standing out there on the landing forever? Company to breakfast. Julius, boil the brandy. My dear Mr. Beckwith, I see no food about. 
nothing to eat but these salted herrings. Yes, uh, Julius believes in keeping up my thirst. Uh, you will forgive me, Mr. Uh, 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 Samson, uh, the way I am dressed. Uh, this whole dressing gown is all I seem to have. Uh, my clothes have all dis disappeared. Sorry, Mr. Slinkton. You could fetch him some food to eat. The man is ill. Mr. Samson, you're a man of the world. I'll be plain with you. Oh, no, you won't. I understand your object in visiting here. London Life wishes to save its funds and escape from its liabilities. These are old tricks of the trade with you insurance gentlemen. But you will not do it, sir. Uh, Julius, I f found some branding. No, you will not be able to evade payment, sir, should anything happen to this dear man. You will not succeed, Mr. Sampson. You have not an easy adversary to play against when you play against me. When the time comes and Mr. Beckwith is no more, we shall have to inquire when and how he fell into his present habits. Uh, uh, Julius, gentlemen, I drink to your health. Sir, Mr. Sampson... I put this incoherent poor creature aside and wish you a good morning. With that, Alfred Beckwith took his entire glass of brandy and threw it right into Slinkton's face and then the glass after it. As he mopped the blood and brandy away, Julius Slinkton saw before him a man no longer reeling and trembling, but a changed, determined, forceful Alfred Beckwith. Slinkton, look at me, you villain. See me as I really am. I took these rooms to bait a trap for you. You thought me a poor drunkard, an imbecile. You insured my life, did you? I saw Mr. Sampson before you did. Your plot has been known to us all along. Having baited you with a prize of 2,000 pounds, you were going to kill me off with brandy. And since the brandy didn't seem to be working quickly enough, you were pouring poison into my glass. Oh, so I was not too far gone not to observe you. The man is mad. Obviously a drunkard and a fool. Murderer. Why do you suppose I was certain you would fall into the trap? Because you are no stranger to me, Julius Slinkton. I knew you, murderer, who for so much money had poisoned one innocent girl while she trusted you and was on the point of killing another. <laughs> are we going to stand here, Mr. Sampson, and listen to the ravings of this lunatic? Uh, perhaps we had better, but... While you may be able to deceive your young ladies, this old bird was not fooled. Do you think that I drank all the liquor you plied me with? I poured it away. And then when you were out, I let myself into your apartment, investigated your papers, took samples from your poison bottles, your packets of powder, changed the contents to harmless sugar, lest you be out trying to kill more innocents. Dear me, Mr. Sampson, don't you find all this a little... Repetitious and boring. Not half as repetitious as your private journal spelling out in detail page after page how long it took you to do away with your victim. The size of the doses. The, the, the signs of gradual decay upon the mind and body. The fancies produced. The pain inflicted. It's repetitious, but not boring. Mr. Samson, I cannot remain in this poor demented creature's presence any longer. I'm going back to my apartment. You won't find that journal in the secret drawer of your writing desk any longer. Then you are a thief. And I am also your niece Marjorie's shadow. I followed you to Eastbourne, made certain Mr. Samson was on hand when you tried to use Beachy Head as the scene of a suicide. And all the while plying Miss Nina with medicine. You said medicine indeed. Ah... Uh. Who are you? Why have you pursued me like this? Are you the police? No, Mr. Slinkton. We are life insurers. We bank on the life, not the death of those we insure. I am not the police. Beckwith, who are you? When you sent the sweet Margaret Niner, whom you murdered, to the office of John Meltham... It fell to his lot to see her, speak with her, give her the insurance forms naming you as beneficiary. But it did not fall to his lot to save her. Having lost her, he had but one object left in life, and that was to avenge her and destroy you. I am John Beltham. Julius 
Lincoln was apprehended, brought to trial, and condemned to pay for his crimes with his life. John Milton, I am happy to say, is beginning to recover from the sadness of having lost his first love. At least, he no longer blames himself for her death. And it may very well be, if he and Marjorie Niner continue to see one another, they will both find a happiness long delayed. As for myself, Edgar Sampson, I look very carefully at the line marked beneficiary in your policy. I try to find out as much as I can before we ensure your life. Insurance files are filled with stories like the one you just heard. Recently, a man was insured for $50,000. He was thrown into an icy river, left to catch pneumonia, poisoned with alcohol, set afire, run over by a car, and still the man would not die. Others have not fared so well. Is there a precaution, an answer? I'll try to give you one when I return shortly. Yes, it was over 125 years ago that Charles Dickens wrote this brilliant expose, especially for American readers, serialized in a New York newspaper. Have times and crimes changed that much in well over a century? Deceit for gain, murder for profit. I'm afraid not. The answer, then, is to be on one's guard. Ask, who stands to win if you lose your life? Find out. Be careful, and you may live longer. Our cast included Gordon Heast, Patricia Elliott, Robert Dryden, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown.